Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second in our three-part series on Southern identity. My name is Anderson Cook, coordinator for the South Carolina State Library and Read SC, the South Carolina affiliate Center for the Book with the Library of Congress. Thanks so much for joining everyone today. We are so excited that you were able to join us for this program. My name is Melissa Giblin. I'm Programs Coordinator at North Carolina Humanities. It's my pleasure to be speaking to you today. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about North Carolina Humanities, and then uh, we will do a little bit of housekeeping and turn it back to Anderson to introduce today's moderator. At North Carolina Humanities, we aim to bring North Carolinians together to have shared experiences around the humanities and to dialogue amongst themselves to create understanding and deeper human connections uh, that can strengthen our statewide community. After listening to today's conversation, we hope that you will consider the different perspectives shared today about how the characters and subjects in the works that the authors will talk about reflect experiences of growing up. You can learn more about North Carolina Humanities and our programs by visiting our website at www.nchumanities.org. North Carolina Center for the Book, an affiliate of the National Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, is a program of North Carolina Humanities. North Carolina Humanities is a statewide nonprofit and affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. For today's housekeeping, the webinar is being recorded. If you would like, there is a closed captioning feature available for this program. At the bottom of your screen, please click the closed caption CC button and click to view subtitles to turn on the closed caption feature. We'd love to hear from you during today's event. If you have a question, please send it through the Q&A button and we will be getting to that closer towards the end of the program. I will now turn it back to Anderson to introduce today's moderator. Thanks, Melissa. Jonathan Haupt is our moderator for today, and he is the executive director of the Pat Conroy Literary Center and former director of the University of South Carolina Press. He serves as an associate producer of the SCETV author interview program by the river and hosts the monthly podcast live from the Pat Conroy Literary Center on the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. There is plenty more that I could say about Jonathan, but in the essence of time, I would like to go ahead and hand it over to him to introduce our authors. Thank you, Anderson, and thank you, Melissa, and many, many thanks to North Carolina Humanities and to South Carolina State Library for putting on this series. Uh, what a wonderful thing to do. What a wonderful thing for us to get to take part of. I'm going to, you know, by way of very quick introduction, I'm going to explain where I am today and the serendipity of this because it relates directly to our, our conversation. I'm at uh, what is now Beaufort Middle School, but in the 1960s, this was Beaufort High School. And this military brat came here in 1961 after having lived in 23 other towns and never really feeling like he was connected to anywhere. And this is a place that was really formative in his education. His name was Pat Conroy, perhaps you've heard of him. And I'm here today because we're holding our Camp Conroy, our summer camp uh, here in this very location, about two, I'm about two classrooms now from, uh, two classrooms down from the room that uh, was Gene Norris's classroom, Pat's sort of quintessential and iconic teacher. So I'm in the very same hallway where Pat Conroy started to step into the writing life that would eventually be his destiny. And what a wonderful place uh, from which to get to moderate today's conversation with Maris, Susan, and Andrew. So let me go ahead and introduce them as well. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk about what it means to them and in a bigger sense uh, what it means to grow up Carolina. Maris Lawyer is the winner of the 2020 South Carolina Novel Prize, uh, the result of which is her newly published debut novel, The Blue Line Down. Maris is a born and bred native of the South Carolina upstate. She earned her degree in creative writing from Anderson University and now works for an environmental consulting firm in Greenville. She lives in nearby Easley, South Carolina with her husband, Benjamin, and their two cats. Susan Beckham Zarenda taught literature and writing to high school and college students for more than 30 years. Bless you for doing that, Susan. Uh, Susan received her undergraduate and graduate degrees in English from Converse College in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Bells for Eli, her debut novel, is the recently named winner of the Independent Publisher Book Award for Best First Novel. She lives in Spartanburg with her husband, Wayne. And Andrew K. Clark is a writer from Alexander, North Carolina. He's the author of the debut poetry collection, Jesus in the Trailer, which was shortlisted for the Abel Muse Book Award. 
Andrew earned his BA in English and his MBA at Georgia Southern University, and more recently his MFA from Converse College. He lives in Asheville, North Carolina, with his wife, Casey, and four children. So thanks to all three of you uh, for being with us today <clears throat> here in our Zoom room to talk about growing up Carolina. So I want to start with sort of quintessential Southern question. Where are you all from? Susan, you want to go first for us? I'll be glad to. I am from the small town of Lancaster, South Carolina, as are some of my ancestors for about seven generations. Lancaster um, was built on Springs Mills. And in my coming of age in the 60s and early 70s, that was a heyday. Um, for, for Springs Mills and it put the bread and butter on our table. My father was, was an engineer there. So it's, it was a wonderful time and place to grow up, at least from a child's perspective. It seemed very uncomplicated and unchaotic. Of course, darkness had to lurk beneath. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Uh, a sort of quick follow-up question, and I'll ask this uh, of our other panelists as well. How does that place or does that place inform your writing, whether it's Bells for Eli or the larger scope of, of your writing life? I think it, not, not in any short stories that, that I've written, but I think in Bells for Eli, there certainly are bits and pieces of Lancaster in there because it, it is set in a fictitious small town called Green Branch, South Carolina in the 60s and early 70s. And I think there's a little bit of Lancaster in there. I think there's a little bit of Winsboro in there. There's a little bit of Spartanburg in there. I mean, it's fictitious, but it's it's been fun for me, for folks from Lancaster who've read the novel to, I, I just had a great time picking up names from my childhood, my childhood doctor, my childhood principal. And they all think, you know, I'm really writing about Dr. Crawford and Miss Crockett. But anyway, the, um, it's it it was just a lot of fun to to go back to that time. I bet. Yeah, that's always the danger of including proper nouns, whether they're people or places <laughs> uh, that, that may be familiar to your readers from your own life. Andrew, how about you? Where where are you from? Where did you grow up? And, and does that inform your poetry, your writing? Yeah, so I grew up in Alexander, North Carolina, which is just a small, I don't even want to use the word town, but community north of Asheville, about 20, 30 minutes north. So uh, kind of a rural area. You know, grew up, you know, baling hay and planting tobacco and, and you know, playing our playground was was in the barns. Right. So all those things kind of do play a role with the writing. My people um, actually settled in the western North Carolina mountains uh, before the Revolutionary War. Uh, Barnardsville is where most of them were, but then they kind of spread over time. And so that sort of ancestry here in the, the tales my grandparents told, you know, growing up in the mountains in the Great Depression and prior to that. Um, heavily influences my writing. I, I, my book is a, a book of poetry, so there's some, some poems have some autobiographical elements to them, and some are more persona type poems, but always kind of the themes of my childhood growing up with the religious tradition that we have of camp meetings and revivals and, and those kind of things all kind of work their way into my work. Mm. So the, the experiences of your own childhood, but also the larger experiences that shape the, the community from which you're from, both sort of permeate your writing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Maris, how about you? Uh, your bio says you're born and bred in the upstate, but where exactly? Where are you from? I, uh, I grew up in Seneca, South Carolina, and um, I've really never left, left the upstate. Went to, like I said, I went to college in Anderson and now live here in, in Easley. So uh, I've... I've never left this little corner of the state, uh, but I, I love it. That's why I've never left. Um, and you, you're asking how that informs uh, my writing. And, you know, when they say to, to write what you know, and I started the Blue Line Dine when I was 21. You don't know much at 21, <laughs> but I knew this area. Uh, I knew how people talked. I knew, uh, you know, some of the history of this area, you know, even things like, uh, you know, trees and, and the things in the woods, like we grew up in the woods and, know what what grows here and how it grows here and uh, stuff like that I was like well that's what I'm gonna that's what I'm gonna settle on so uh, that's that's kind of how I uh, kind of leaned into to that you know claiming the territory for what, what you're writing about mm -hmm. yeah Pat Conroy would applaud you for that he said often that storytellers uh, can and must come from anywhere and everywhere so uh, Seneca was due for its storyteller uh, <laughs> 
Uh, you mentioned a couple things that I want to kind of build off on about, uh, you know, sort of understanding the way people talk, the lexicon of the environment in which you grow up and, and the, uh, the, the natural environment as well. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what really is the uh, sort of quintessential ingredients of, of Southern writing, of Southernness. The one thing you never have to wonder in a Southern novel or Southern story or most Southern poetry is where it takes place, right? Because you're always going to be, be told that because place is, is always, almost always a character in, in Southern writing. So let's talk a little bit about what that means to you as people of the South. Uh, what, what is the South that, that folks are trying to capture in Southern writing? What's the South that you are trying to capture in your own writing? Andrew, you want to take that one first for us? Yeah, I, I think uh, Maris hit on it. You know, it, it's 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 the trees that are here, the birds that are here, the the, the native uh, foliage that we we have, and the way people talk. You know, I was, I was one time at one of these writers' conferences, and the editor was looking over some of my pages, and he said, "People don't really talk like this." And I'm like, "Well, you did, you didn't meet my grandfather." You know, um, so uh, you know he would say things like, "Don't th they throw it off on my people?" You know. Uh, throwing this apostrophe D at the end of throw. And so trying to capture that, that language. And then also uh, those traditions, like I said before about religion, uh, you know, there's a joke, you can't throw a rock in the South without hitting a church. And there, there's a lot of truth to that. And I didn't realize it until I was outside the South and I could see kind of the difference. And so uh, trying to capture that something, something of the essence of the people and also doing it in a way where there's love in that, and that it's not a caricature. I think that's a challenge too, because um, a lot of what we see in Hollywood is really a caricature of what the people are really like. So trying to be authentic, but also uh, write about uh, write about folks with love. And, and, and that's kind of my goal with my poetry. Well, thank you. Yeah, great answer. Maris, you want to speak to that as well? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I agree that you kind of have to to get outside the South to know what makes a southern <laughs> um and you know i think people when they when they think southern literature they think the south is it tends to be a very romantic uh image uh tends to, i think it tends to lean a lot towards the coast um but you know there's there's so much more to the south and southern identity than you know plantations along the, the coastline and i think that's where a lot of people have still been stuck um and i think we're starting to draw out of that a little bit as far as covering you know, so many more different areas, different kinds of little communities. I mean, you, you, you go into two different towns in little South Carolina and you'll find two different cultures there, you know? Um, so I think that the nuances there is something that it's really hard to capture. I think people are starting to, to realize that a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it, I, it, it's, it's a hard thing to, to really communicate that to folks who don't grow up here. Do you feel a, a sense of responsibility for capturing that authenticity of the South that, that Andrew mentioned in, in your own writing? I, I, I do. I remember um, taking Appalachian literature in college and, um, you know, the books that, that we read in that class, my, my professor had chosen intentionally to, to move away from caricature, but sometimes you still see it. Um, and you know, I think that as, as Southern writers, uh, it's like what Andrew said, you know, oh, well, people don't talk that way. It's like, well, you, you don't, you haven't met the right people then. <laughs> I mean, so I, I have a real strong accent, but then I talk to somebody who's not from the South and they pick up immediately that I'm from the South. Um, so, you know, there's there's so much variety in, in how people talk, how people, you know, communicate to each other, their, their routines, their daily life. Um, and you know, to try and, and really thoughtfully capture that. And really, I mean, you don't always notice things when it's part of your life, when it's part of your community, but really try to hone in on that um, and kind of show it to people through your writing. I mean, this it's a hard challenge, but I, I do feel like it's important um, to include that in, in writing. And I think we've all seen it done badly uh, as well, too, uh, in books and films and TV shows where, you know, we get a vision of the South that doesn't feel authentic to our own experiences or that is sort of a homogenous South as though the South were one thing and not, not many things for many, many cultures and many locations. Susan, you wanna talk a little bit uh, about the South, uh, what that is uh, from your perspective as a writer, what, what South you're trying to capture in your own writing? Um, 
because I, so much of the South, or at least my South, is is fairly rural. And and I, I love Maris's comment that you kind of have to leave the South to really understand because I, I, I'm older than <laughs> you all are, and and there's so much we take for granted. You know, it you, you grow up thinking, well, this is the world, this is the way it is, and of course it's not. And I've you know, you, you talked about traditions, and I think traditions and protocol and mores are very powerful in Southern identity. It doesn't matter whether you are from a blue blood or a middle working class or you're impoverished. There are these sort of unspoken traditions and protocols that that we follow. Um, and I'm, that may be true in other parts of the country too, but I, I don't know that. And I think traditionally home and family has been a tremendous presence um, in Southern identity and, and in its in its novels. Um, you know, our connection to the past, if we're indigenous Southerners, our connection to the past, either individually or with the South in general, is 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 can be quite powerful. I mean, how many times have you had someone ask you, who are your people? You know, who are your people? They want to know. And then of course, if at least if you're from South Carolina, if you tell them who your people are, they know something about those people. And, and there's, it's a connection. You're, you're gonna find a connection. And I, I think another powerful part of Southern identity is, is, is loyalty, you know? Even, um, you know, whether for good or ill, we tend to stick by our folks. Um, <laughs> we, we tend to do it. And uh, like in my novel, there's, you know, there's this very powerful alliance between the two main characters because Delia feels like she's got to be her cousin Eli's defender. She's because no one else is going to do that uh, for him. So we have a lot of so many um, factors. And, and I'll mention one more thing because we, we haven't talked about, th I mean, there are things in Southern identity, I think, too. And, and one that's really powerful is, is letting go. Southerners have a very difficult time letting go. And so I, I think it's true in life and it's true in literature and, and that whole idea of letting go and then recovery is, is I think, very strong. Mm. Yeah. Our friend Ron Rash in uh, The World Main Straight talks about the past and the present happening layered upon one on top of the other. The, the, the past, both the, our collective past and our personal past is always with us, never really escapable. Of course, uh, Faulkner had some thoughts on that as well. Of course, that's not that's not unique to Ron Rash, uh, but let's talk about that on a on a more personal level and circle back around to our our major topic our, uh, in our webinar here today. This idea of growing up. So, uh, for the three of you, for each of you, what ultimately does it mean to to grow up? What what is that? Uh, what do you get out of that phrase? What do you hear when you hear that phrase? And what specifically, if anything comes to mind, do you think is unique about growing up in the Carolinas, in this part of the South? Um, and I won't call on anybody in particular. If anybody wants to jump in, if anybody's got some thoughts on that, uh, step in. Well, I'm unmuted, shall I start? Oh. Okay. <laughs> I noticed that I'm on the muted one. I think, I mean, it's to grow up is obviously to live through the various stages of childhood and then to become aware of the significance of those passages and, and to come to the point where you make adult decisions, but you understand the consequences and the implications of those decisions. And I don't know, I think I'm still growing up, if that makes any sense. I think I, here I'm, you know, I am of a mature age and I'm still coming of age. Um, in a lot of ways, but I remember stages growing up in, in my small town of, of and of being, well, I was hyper aware of entering junior high school, you know, of of getting my hair styled in a, something I'd seen in Seventeen magazine, of, of begging my mother to, to buy mini skirts for me. And, and then I grew up in a time, uh, maybe it was just my mother was overprotective or OCD or something, but, you know, she said a lot of those stages. You know, when could I walk to school by myself for the first time? Something kids can't even do anymore. When could I ride my bike uh, to my friends' houses? When could I shave my legs? Um, all of those things, uh, some of them are prescribed stages, but they still have an effect. 
um, on their coming of age. And, you know, as far as my own growing up, as I mentioned, from a child's perspective, it was pretty uncomplicated and, and, and it was a calm time. I mean, a routine week usually started, you mentioned this, Andrew, with going to church on Sunday and it ended with outings on Saturdays, whether we drove around looking at houses and getting ice cream or whether we went out to my great aunt's home out in the country and sat on the front porch where my grandfather and his siblings gathered. Um, it, it, and, you know, there, there were this, just these certain things. You never missed a high school football game on Friday night. You prayed for snow um, so that the dads would build a bonfire at the top of Hawthorne Lane and you could sled until you just simply couldn't do it anymore. And, you know, it's sort of different maybe from you all, especially you, Maris. We had so much more freedom, you know, growing up to be able to come of age when I was a child because parents didn't worry so much about encroaching danger. We didn't have any cell phones for parents to track us. My mother told me to be home by dinner time, um, and my stomach guided me. If my brother and I were out playing kick the can in the neighborhood, after dark, we need to go home because whoever's yard we were in, the mama would lean out the door and holler for us to go home. That it was just a, you know, we didn't have we didn't have television in our rooms. Um, we didn't have air conditioning until I was in my mid teens, and so it was just as hot inside as it was outside. So that took us outside a, a, an awful lot more, I think, than children today. I had this little place in the wooded area behind my house where I built this little fire ring of rocks and I'd set these little fires and I thought of it as my thinking place and that's where I would go so it was you know enough I can reminisce forever <laughs> oh thank you Susie. I think you, I think you approached the question in a really interesting way to give us sort of memorable snapshots from from your from your growing up in the Carolinas so I uh, appreciate that Andrew Maris do you want to add to this yeah, I, I think another theme of growing up, no matter where you grew up, is sort of a loss of innocence, right? And so um, in, in my poetry and also a novel that I'm, I'm shopping, there's, there's sort of that point where, uh, you know, as a, as a child, you realize your dad is, in, is fallible, right? The preacher is fallible, right? There's something about uh, sort of understanding that. And I do think it's unique in the South. And you know, I, I, my childhood sounds a lot like Susan's. You know, we didn't have air conditioning until I was older. There was no cable TV. It wasn't even available. And, and on our rural route, that's where our mailing address was, right? The street, the, the road wasn't even named. Um, and so we did, we stayed outside. You know, it was, it was cooler outside for one thing. And if you got in the woods, you got in the shade, it was cooler. And so we, we spent the, the time playing there. You know, we played in uh, lofts of barns um, and uh, took tobacco steaks and, and you know, had sword fights with my cousins, right? So, um, but the, I do think that, you know, it's a, a theme in all literature, right? This loss of innocence, and that is sort of the coming of age where there's a realization that the, the people maybe that you idolized as a child were not what you thought they were. And, and I see that a lot in, in Pat Conroy's work as well. So um, to me, that's kind of part of that growing up story in addition to the landscape of what we encountered, you know, in my case, in the mountains in North Carolina, what, what it looked like, the snow in the wintertime, um, that we get less of now because of the weather change, climate change, and um, praying for the, that snow so that you wouldn't have to go to school and, and be able to, you know, kind of sl sled all day and, and um, you know, stay outside until, until somebody made you come inside. That's a, it's a really good point about innocence, because once those, those moments are gone, you cannot, there is no turning back. You know, there is no turning back. Maris, you want to add to that? Uh, what does is, what is growing up in the big sense mean, and, and what, uh, so, so what are some of the defining aspects of your growing up in the, in the Carolinas? Yeah, I think, um, I think this is true of a broader sense, but especially in the Carolinas, you know, um, Susan, you're mentioning how, you know, you have your people in, in, here in the South, and, um, you know, I think that one of the things of growing up in the South is, is figuring out your, your beliefs and your opinions, sometimes if they're separate from your, your family. Um, and, and that can cause, I mean, that's anywhere you go, that's going to cause drama, but especially in here, it causes a lot of a strife. And unfortunately, it's not something I've had to encounter a lot in my personal life, but I think that was because my parents gave me kind of, I don't, I don't think this is a usual experience for folks, especially in this area, but, you know, when we were probably five or six, they said, we don't want 
me and my sister that said, we don't want you to only grow up around people with the same color skin, same accent, same religion, every all, you know, all that. So they got us involved with the international students at Clemson University. You could kind of, like I said, adopt a student program. And so from the ages of about six to, gosh, probably 12 or 13 uh, consistently, we, we had international students in our house, seems like almost every weekend, eating food, talking to them about, you know, their religion, their, you know, the fairy tales and stuff that they grew up on, all these different things that were different from what we, we you know, knew and grew up, grew up with. But it, I didn't realize I was older, but it made me very comfortable around other um, cultures, languages, religions, that sort of thing. Um, while still, you know, finding my own identity in what I grew up with. And um, I don't think many other young people got that experience, but it's something I'm thankful for, I think, because it's, I, I realize now how uncommon that is. What a wonderful experience to have had, to have uh, found a way to bring the world to you uh, without, without having to leave uh, the upstate of South Carolina. That's fantastic. Thank my parents for that. So, <laughs> I think they're in the Zoom room right now, actually, if I've been reading through the chat correctly. <laughs> uh, so let's kind of transition from your, your own personal experiences to uh, sort of a, a broader vision of here. Uh, uh, within the framework of growing up. What, what uh, to you as writer or even as reader for that matter, are sort of the quintessential elements of a coming of age story? And, and in your own opinions, uh, is what you've written, are, are the books that you have in print inclusive of that? Do they fit within the umbrella of coming of age narratives? So, and that may be a, a trickier question for you, Andrew, as a poet, but there may be a way into that. We'll find out in a second. Uh, Susan, you want to kick us off for that one? Right. One thing I think a coming of age story is not is portraying childhood as a condition to be overcome. It's a condition to be embraced. It's a journey of self-discovery and maturity. It's, you know, it's both the joys and the inevitable difficulties that each person deals with. And, and of course we do grow up more through our painful experiences than otherwise. And like I mentioned a few minutes ago, once, once we have those experiences, we, we can't turn back. You know, I taught English forever and I, you know, remember a poem, it was kind of a, a prelude poem to Wordsworth's intimations on immortality, but it's called my heart leaps up and there's a line in there that says the child is the father of the man. And the speaker of that poem, you know, has this wish that he can always maintain that sense of wonder. Um, he, he believes he can do it, but of course we understand that, that that's just not, it's not always possible. It's, it's not possible to go back um, in the same way. And I think, you know, especially in our, our writing, in our, in our literature, of course, that coming of age usually happens in a more dramatic way um, because you can't cover everything in a novel um, or story or poem. But in reality, often it's, it's a slower progression. Um, I think it, it, there really is no certain moment that defines when a person has come of age, that it's something that happens by degrees. And I think I said it a few minutes ago that it's when you realize that you've, you've made a decision and you understand the implications of it, and that you, you've also grown into an awareness of social expectations and norms, whether you rebel against them or whether you adhere to them. You, you, know, you, you know what they are, and then it is your decision, your, your identity that tells you what to do with that. Mr. Conroy would certainly agree with you that coming of age is a, is a lifelong process and not sort of, you know, this, this liminal moment between childhood and adulthood. He uh, said very late in life, just around his 70th birthday, that his whole writing career, the whole 50 year arc of his writing career had been trying to understand 15, 16 year old Pat Conroy, the kid who walked the halls of the building that I'm in. Right. And he wasn't sure he, he understood him, but he knew that he loved him, that he absolutely mm -hmm. loved that kid. And he was still in the act of becoming, even even right. at the cusp yeah. of seventy. Yeah. I believe that very firmly. Just real quick, my my mother died when I was thirty-two, and I, I thought I was a grown-up. 
I was teaching school, I was raising children, I was married, I was handling finances, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't until she died that I realized I really wasn't a grown up. I was still very um, dependent on her. I, this is embarrassment to say, and this will be recorded. I had never spent, I don't sure I had spent a night alone until my mother died. Even my husband would go out of town. I'd call my mother and she'd come a running. And so once she was gone, I had to, I had to step up to the plate. And, and now it's just laughable to me that I think I love to spend the night alone. It's laughable to me, but there I was 32 years old thinking, I got it. I got this all handled. And you don't realize that that sort of unconditional love that C.S. Lewis talks about it with his mother, that it, once it's gone, there are moments, but what is it he said you know the great continent continent of atlantis sank andrew looks like a guy who spent a couple nights alone <laughs> yeah a few absolutely um but yeah i think that's a that's a great point this dependence that family uh we have on family and i think there is something unique about the southern family maybe the carolinas family we could argue there's a sort of a tightness there that you have uh, sort of a respect for your elders that you're taught, even if you do make different choices or have different beliefs. And, and again, that's part of the burden of the writer is to capture the essence of those people with love, right? And, and do it in a respectful way, but be honest, you know, tell the, tell the ugly truth. I mean, so if uh, in, in my collection of poetry, there are poems about racism, right? And I've heard it and experienced it in my own family, right? So you have to be honest with that, but you also have to sort of couch uh, some of it with uh, respect and love. But as far as coming of age goes, I think, um, you know, in, in my work, there, there are poems that deal with, you know, with death. Um, think about a child. Uh, one of the ways that we learn about death as children is, is sometimes, unfortunately, it's through the loss of a parent or grandparent, but also the family dog, right? So in one of my poems, I capture kind of the experience of the child, you know, in, in our, in our, our uh, neck of the woods, if your uh, dog was sick or something, it went off in the woods and died or it went off somewhere and died. There wasn't, um, you know, it didn't live in the house with you necessarily all the time. Uh, and so um, you'd go off and try to find it. And um, so in one of my poems, the, the boy discovers his, you know, dog uh, has died in the, in the barn. And so uh, it's part of that, that realization of our own um, mortality. And um, so that's, that's part of what we try to capture, I think. And that speaks to that loss of innocence you were, you were speaking about earlier as well. That kind of circles us back around to that. Maris, do you want to talk about dead dogs or do you want to talk about what coming of age means uh, within, within the scope of your life as reader or as writer? Sure. Um, well, the, the Blue Line Down, you know, I do think of it as a coming of age story. Um, growing up, I was always told that coming of age story really kind of centered around a character in their early teens. Um, and I think just as I get older, I realize, like what y'all said, that the coming of age never ends. Um, you know, what, what is that age <laughs> that, that you're coming to? Um, but one thing that I kind of focused on in the Blue Line Down is, you know, there is a point where, where Jude, the main character, you know, as a young teenager, he, he is off on his own. He is providing for himself. Um, you know, he, that should have been his coming of age moment, but the main distinction is that he um, he doesn't have any peers, he doesn't have any mentors, he's isolated, uh, and so he does, he misses that moment. He kind of is, is is stagnant. He kind of lacks direction until he hits you know his early to mid twenties, and that's when he starts to things. That's where kind of the second half of the story picks up, and um, you know that's when he starts to interact with other people to to kind of find some a sense of brotherhood um, and and connect with other folks. And so I, I think I realized that even as I was writing it, that coming of age centers so much on community. Young people need community. If you're talking about a traditional coming of age sense, um, you know, if you don't have people who are pushing you, uh, people who are guiding you, you kind of, you can miss that moment. Um, you know, we, we see, certainly see young people, they gravitate towards their friends and that can be frustrating. I think for a lot of parents when they're always wanting to go out with friends and, and not be with, with family, but you know, it's kind of shaping their sense of identity and that that does I think contribute to that coming of age who am I who am I in relation to these people do I want to be like these people do I not uh, all that is is for part of the you know 
forming your identity and, and that's that's key to coming of age so um that's what I, I guess through writing about that that's what I kind of discovered about coming of age is that it, it depends so much on the people in your life and that's why you have to be careful about it well said and, and you've you've brought us back around to a couple of topics uh, that are worth mentioning as well uh, the idea of, of forming an identity or an identity for that part of your life, if that's what the, what the coming of age is, coming to the age that you are in that moment. But it's also uh, uh, something you said and, and something uh, that I think is, is certainly uh, reflected in your novel, not just figuring out who you want to be, but figuring out where you want to be as well. What's, what's the home for that moment of your life, what's the place where you can be the person that you want to be, where you're going to you're going to be in a community that's going to uh, welcome that, and you're going to be of use and, and uh, have some impact on that community as well. So, so let's sort of see if we can bridge those uh, those two things: identity and place, which we've uh, both talked about a little bit. We've talked about both a little bit. Um, Susan, how did those things come together in, in your novel? How do, how do your characters become and wh how, why is the place that they're in essential to that becoming? Um, <clears throat> I, I look at Bells for Eli also as, as being um, a coming of age story uh, among other things, but it's unusual um, in the sense that one of the main characters, Eli, has a traumatic physical accident on his third birthday. And, and of course he's too young to come of age, but, but because um, he swallows red devil eye and that gives him a metal trach in his throat and a stomach tube through which his fed makes him smell bad and a strange string behind his ear that's there to, to pull up a dilator when necessary. So he's taunted and he's bullied um, by, by his peers. And, and that from a very early age, he develops into a very stoic little person. Um, it, it guides his life. Um, he, he, he's stoic. He steals himself against um, tormentors. But, it, but something else happens too. And that is from a, an age beyond really his years, he becomes more caring and empathetic of other people's conditions and other people's situations. Um, uh, those of his own color, those who are not, those who have physical disfigurements, those those who did not do not. Now, Delia, who is the protagonist, um, as I mentioned earlier, she becomes Eli's only friend and defender, and, and they form this unconditional love, this bond. Um, and so her identity in a lot of ways, or her coming of age, is sort of formed around Eli's, um, that they, they're formed around each other. So Eli has to lose his innocence. That doesn't really mean he fully understands, but he, he, he loses an awful lot of innocence at a very a young age because of the consequences of the accident. And Delia becomes, I think, a more nurturing, her, her nurturing abilities are, are mature beyond her years of childhood. Now, near the end of the novel, she's the protagonist, and near the end of the novel, she's 21 years old. And there is a very difficult situation related to Eli that brings her into vivid adult maturity. But I can't talk about what happens because to do so would just be a horrific spoiler for the book. Wouldn't be point in reading it, maybe. Um, but it's 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 kind of different in the sense that their coming of age, so to speak, starts so young. Doesn't mean they they quite have the cognitive awareness, but they they just develop around it, if that makes sense. It does, but uh, one, one quick follow-up question to that for additional context. How does the, the small town setting of your novel make that transformation possible or how does it complicate it? Why, why does this story have to be told in the place in which it's set? I, I, I two things, the, the time in which it takes place, the, the 60s and the 70s, and the fact that it is a small town. So you, you have a period where, at least in the small town south that I knew, it's still very insular. Um, there's still that kind of, um, I don't know, American dream ex, you know, expectation. The fathers go to work every day and the mothers take care of it and everything, you know, everything is in its place in the world. But these people are human beings and things lurk beneath the surface and the counterculture is in, is encroaching and Eli embraces the counterculture. Delia 
far more goes with the status quo, but she um, she wants very much to be a top autonomous, and she's she's very maybe because of taking care of Eli, but she's very self directed. So that is one of the big conflicts in the novel is is place. Um, what do you do here? Here we are in this insular place, but wait, the world is breaking open both from an outward perspective and from an inner perspective of what those characters' needs are. Thank you. Great answer. Maris, we can speak to this next. How do the place or places, um, you know, both physical locations and the time, the historical setting of your novel, uh, sort of how, how are those essential for the, the transformation and the challenges of your character in the, in the coming of age arc? Well, I, uh, I chose, it was kind of chosen for me, uh, working, you know, talking about the Baldwin Feltz, you're, you're kind of centered in the coal country up towards, you know, West Virginia. Um, but I elect, I mean, I could have told the whole story up there because, you know, part of the, the other part of the story is, is with moonshiners and, and that was happening up there too. But um, like I said at the beginning, you know, I, this is the area I, I really knew um, and wanted to bring it back down here. But, um, you know, starting off up towards the West Virginia, Virginia area, and then coming down to South Carolina. And there's, there is a difference, um, you know, when you talk to people of Appalachia in that region towards Southern Appalachia, uh, just like I was saying that there's, there's these little nuances in different communities in the South. And um, sometimes they're little, sometimes they're, they are big. Um, but, you know, telling the story of the, the moonshiners and some of the, the poverty issues that were mirrored in in Virginia and, and with the, the coal miners and then the, the poverty here with folks getting trapped in, in the cycle of, of bootlegging. Um, you know, that's something I wanted, I was interested in kind of talking about is looking at the larger cultural context of uh, how these people were kind of marginalized or how they didn't receive, you know, the same resources or, or help or education that would help pull them out of some of these cycles while still staying true to who they were and what their culture was. Um, so a lot of that, like, that, like I said, it was kind of chosen for me when I chose the topic, but um, it's something that I really enjoyed researching and kind of delving into. Thank you, that, that's great. Yeah, how did you come to know, uh, how did you come to discover the topic? You, you say it was sort of chosen for you, but I mean, you as, as storyteller are involved in that selection as well. So how did you come to know about this? Yeah, so that, that Appalachian literature course that I was talking about, it was my, um, the fall semester of my senior year. Um, Randall Wilhelm over at Anderson University taught it. He was uh, fantastic. It was the first time he had taught that course. He developed it brand new for us and just blew it out of the water. Um, but he really, something Dr. Wilhelm always did was he never just talked books. He, he would pull in art, he'd pull in music, he'd pull in history to give a total, as much of a rounded experience as you could of whatever that topic was. And um, we watched a documentary on the like, Cold Wars, and of course, that's when the Baldwin Felts were were introduced. And I'd never heard of them, ever. Um, and I think just realizing the scale of of the drama of these events um, that was just not covered in American history, even for those of us that live in Appalachia, uh, it kind of shocked me. Uh, and the more research I did into the Baldwin Felts, I just realized that they weren't represented. One, it's just hard to find materials on them, period. But certainly in fiction, they're, they're, there's very little representation. There's a couple books that they were mentioned in, but never really um, central players. So um, that's when I, I had to choose a project for my senior seminar to write about. And that's what I chose to write about. I saw a little, um, I guess a whole, <laughs> you know, as a writer, you're, you're trying to figure out what what new can be said. And, and that's that was a hole I spotted. So. Uh, that's kind of, I ran with it. That's great. Our, our friend Wiley Cash had a similar experience discovering the, the history of the Lore Mill strike uh, in Gastonia, where he's from, where he grew up and never once heard of it until he was somewhere else. And, and uh, someone in his college experiences asked him about that when, when we found out Wiley was from Gastonia. And Wiley mm -hmm. realized that not only was that a story he needed to know, it was ultimately a story he needed to write as well. Uh, I see we're putting a call out in the chat for questions from our audience, which we will happily uh, undertake here. But I want to give Andrew a, a chance to respond to this as well. Is there are there moments in your poetry, Andrew, where where place is the challenge, or place informs the challenge in the in the becoming of a character? Yeah, I think uh, place weaves its way through throughout my poetry, and 
one of the things that Maris alluded to is, is sort of the idea of poverty, right? So poverty is different in rural America and Appalachia than it is in other parts of the country. And so, you know, just growing up and hearing my grandfather talk about, he had a brother who died because he had a blood blister on the back of his foot that became infected and he passed away. So you're growing up in the thirties in Appalachia and, and, you know, your brother dies one day, right? From this, from this infection, there wasn't this network of healthcare and the hospitals and things that we have now. And so I, in my poetry, I try to take on different personas that, that sort of experience these things and, and try to tell that story in a faithful way. What are the challenges of doing that, Andrew, of, of writing as the other and to put it in sort of big terms, um, writing as an identity other than your own? Well, it, it, in some ways it gives you some freedom, right? It's sort of like when we create characters in fiction, it gives you some emotional distance there um, and you, it allows you to kind of be empathetic toward other people. But um, I guess the, the perils of it or, or the fears you have are, are not getting it right, especially if you choose to write something outside of your own personal experience. You know, you want to be, uh, you know, faithful to that and, and also do it in, the, in an empathetic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. It's a, it's a difficulty a lot of my young writers here at the camp are experiencing this week of you know, wanting to that follow their imagination where it leads, but it leads to a voice other than their own. And they're, they have uh, some questions about the responsibility and the authenticity that, that adult writers have as well when they cross that same threshold. I don't see a question in the chat yet, so I'm going to ask uh, one more uh, from my list. Uh, always a good question to ask in these moments. What are y'all working on right now? What is what is forthcoming? Y'all have a, a book out there in the world. Uh, is there now pressure, a sense of pressure to create a second book? Or, or are you writing smaller pieces for other, uh, for other opportunities? What are you working on in your writing lives right now? I'll start since I was unmuted here, but um, so I have a novel that I'm shopping. So I'm trying to, to break into the Maris and Susan territory with, with a novel. So I'm, I'm shopping it. It's set in 1930s in Southern Appalachia. It's mostly set in a rural setting, but some parts of it are actually in 1930s Asheville. And then um, as I've finished that book and I'm in the process of trying to, to find a home for it, I'm working on a, a sequel to the book set in the 1980s. And so, um, so those are kind of what I'm working on. So the, the challenge is to sort of develop this long form fiction when I'm more, you know, traditionally I've been more comfortable with short poems or short fiction. Oh, that's fantastic. I wish you well with that. Susan, what about you? What are you writing right now? Well, I'm, I'm not exactly writing at the moment. My, my agent has just, um, well, I've been writing back and forth and revising, but she has just begun shopping um, my second novel and it is also Southern, but it's, it's set um, a little bit closer to modern day. I, I, it, it, ca it calls on my teaching experience and I set it in 2012 because I wanted to set it before technology pretty much took over so much in the classroom. It takes all the ambiance and the uh, <laughs> romance out of it. And it, I, I think place is, it's, it's a Southern, uh, maybe Midtown, uh, mid-sized town high school, but place is very important because of the cultural differences, because this high school kind of has a U-shaped curve, like you've got all the, you got a whole bunch of haves over here, and you got a whole bunch of have-nots, and you don't have very much in, in the middle in this population, so the, the working title is just not right yet, but we're calling it The Teacher and, and the Motel Girl, and it's a, a story in which two high school students from vastly different backgrounds, they, they fall in love because they're both sent to in-school suspension, a place where one of them thought he'd never be. Um, and, and they attempt to navigate some complications that readers might uh, not imagine. And then interwoven with the story of Hazel, who is the, a high school junior living with her family in a rundown motel, um, and the privileged high school senior, Sterling, is the story of their English teacher, Angela Wilmore, as she confronts um, a, a multifaceted, multifaceted challenges of an overloaded public high school teacher and, and that's something teachers face every minute of their day inside and outside the classroom. And I will say, um, Angela is not me, though it calls on my teaching experience. She's a lot nicer and a lot funkier than I ever was. Oh, 
I don't know. I would I would describe you as both nice and funky, Susan. Thank so you, Jonathan. I'm not, I'm not yet convinced she isn't you. <laughs> you will be if you ever read the book. What about, if it becomes a book. What about you, Maris? You've got a first novel out that's all of a month old. Uh, so this seems kind of like a strange question to ask of you, but but are there other things sort of in the queue already for you? Yeah, I felt like I, I had a bunch of things that were kind of on the back burner that I was saying, you know, I, I'll get to you, I'll get to you, if, you know, because it took me years to write Blue Line Down, um, just kind of coming out of college, navigating the new workforce. Um, as a young woman, it, it, you know, trying to figure out that writing rhythm, it took me a long time to write it. Um, and so there's, there's several things I'd like to get to, but um, if anybody follows me on my, my author page, y'all know I have a baby coming in September. So uh, that's, that's put a lot of things kind of in my life on, on hold and just saying, you know what, we're just going to let things happen when it happens. But um, I, I've always, I've always wanted to do something with nonfiction. I don't, I don't know what that's going to look like yet, but um, I loved the projects I did in school with, with our nonfiction workshops. So um, that's something I would really love to, to experiment with, um, to kind of try my hand at, but uh, we'll see, we'll see when that, <laughs> when I get around to it. <laughs> Congratulations on, on Thank the you. forthcoming addition uh, to your family. So uh, we've got a couple of questions popping up in the chat. I'll go ahead and, uh, and insert those into the conversation. Uh, the first one's from Ella Stewart, and it's a great question too. Uh, particularly with this group, uh, she's asking, who are the publishers for your books? And uh, I'm going to vary her question, her follow-up question a little bit. What was the process for you to, to be published and to make the connections with those publishers? So Maris, you, I, I think you should go first in this one because uh, you're, you're a prize winner and that's a great story to tell. Yes, yeah, so um, Hub City uh, published um, published the book, but uh, mine was a unique experience because I submitted to the South Carolina Novel Prize, um, which uh, was kind of a bizarre, I, th I think, again, a, an unusual experience because I, I submitted to the, the prize as a way of giving myself a deadline to finish the book, um, it, it, intending to submit elsewhere because I did not expect to win by any means. Um, and then that's when about when COVID hit. So I just, it kind of went off my radar <laughs> for a while. And so um, it was a, it was a very simple <laughs> process, which I th don't think it, anybody can ever say about trying to get published. Um, but yeah, I submitted it to the, um, to the, the prize or the contest. And then you know, a few months later, got a notification that I was a finalist and then that I had won. So uh, I don't know that I have the most uh, <laughs> helpful, I guess, anecdote for how to get published. It was it was way too easy as far as, uh, I, I guess, easy is not the word, but it was, I was very, very blessed with the opportunity that I had. Um, and I know that, that is not the usual, it usually takes a lot more blood, sweat and tears uh, to get that to happen. Well, what a wonderful experience to have mm -hmm. ha happen in your writing life. And the South Carolina Novel Prize, originally the South Carolina First Novel Prize, is just a great gift to the Palmetto State uh, brought mm -hmm. to us by, by Hub City Press who publishes the winners and by the South Carolina Arts Commission uh, that mm -hmm. makes the prize possible. What a wonderful thing for writers here in South Carolina to have. Totally. Yeah. What about you, Susan? Uh, you're with, if I remember correctly, my friends at Mercer University Press. How did that come about? I am. Um, I, I had, um, I, I got very lucky in a different way from Maris early on. Um, you know, they say you start with the agents that you would most like to have and you work your way down. Well, golly Moses, I sent my manuscript to my agent on a Friday afternoon and on Monday she called me and she said she loved it. And so I thought, wow, this is amazing. I'm whoo. But then the process for publication was much, much longer. And in fact, during those months of her shopping the novel, um, I ended up writing a, a, a pretty intricate subplot of mystery into the novel based on feedback from editors and, and my agent and me talking back and forth. And, and it, you know, I mean, months off, you know, and, and she said, I think something needs to happen to Delia and Eli more than his accident. Something that can, they can, no one else will know and they can never be pulled apart because of this. And I went, oh, well, there's an easy thing to do. 
You know, I wonder what that's going to be. And this is the God's truth. I got on my bicycle, not up here in Spartanburg because too many hills, down in Beaufort where it's nice and flat. I rode for 15 miles. And when I got back, I had thunk up, as they say, what I thought would work. And it was, it, it, it was. I wasn't unhappy with the ending of the novel, but I'm not going to say I thought it was perfect but once I wove that subplot in it all came together in the end what happens with Delia and I thought okay that's what I needed and so we we ultimately ended up going with Mercer University Press a wonderful wonderful house um, to be associated with the folks at Mercer are supportive and and wonderful that's great to hear they are a great crew there at Mercer yeah. they are Andrew, what about you? Uh, it's uh, Main Street Rag, right? That published Jesus in the trailer. Yeah, for poetry, there's uh, poets are typically unagented submissions. So you either enter contests or go directly to the press. So I uh, had the book shortlisted a couple of times and then uh, Main Street Rag you know, offered to, to, to publish the book and they had a really strong reputation for poetry. So I was uh, pretty happy to, to have them there, uh, local press in Charlotte. So I was, I was happy to have them uh, take the book. Mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that Scott Douglas who does it? it? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I met Scott a couple of times. Great guy. Really Absolutely. wonderful. They, they do, a, do a great job of quality books. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a couple more questions and a couple more minutes. So we'll see if we can uh, bring those two things together. Anderson, off camera Anderson, is asking if it would be possible to tell the same kind of story or write the same kind of poems, uh, in your case, Andrew, if you changed the, the setting, either the time or the location, or are, those, are both of those things absolutely essential to the stories that you tell or the poems that you, that you write? They are for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. essential. I, I agree, I, it would be a different, a different book. No question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maris, I think we kind of already addressed that, but you want to you want to add anything else to, to that particular question? Yeah, I um, I think that it's pretty it's pretty pivotal to the how the how the story goes. I think that's I wouldn't say that that's the case for a lot of stories that I read or write, but in this case, it was pretty central to to how the setting and and everything is, is pretty central. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we kind of uh, hit on this earlier in the conversation too, that in, in Southern literature, you never have to wonder where something happens because the setting is almost always absolutely essential to the, to the story. Uh, and you know what Pat Conroy hoped and, and achieved so often was that by digging deeply into the personal and the regional, the sort of hyper-specific moment, you could still get to the universal. You could get to a story that would ring true beyond the, the place and time in which it was being told. We've got, um, oh, a couple of more questions now. Hey, Susie McMahon. Uh, and we got another one from Ella too. So I'll try and take both of these for you. The first one uh, from Susie is do you find stories come to you easily or that inspiration comes easily or do you have a daily writing routine uh, where you have to kind of m make sure those things happen so anybody want to want to speak to that you do your writing process they have to percolate with me um and and i i i do to a large extent write from it what I know, I mean, most of the stories and certainly Bells for Eli and certainly the new book, they, they, they start out from some sort of inspiration or maybe a situation that I've known. Um, and, and then I let it try to take on a, a life of its own. Um, but I, I don't try to write about worlds beyond what I know anything about. And I don't have a regular writing routine unless I'm working on something, then I do. Okay, Andrew or Maris, do you want to speak to that too? Um, yeah, so I think a writer is always writing. So uh, Susan's way of describing it percolating. When I'm hiking, I'm, I'm writing. Uh, I have all these weird voice memos on my phone and, and weird notes that I try to translate later when, when I just try to get down ideas. Um, but I do have a fairly consistent writing routine. It's not every day because of work and you know, obligations, but um, I, I try to try to get something down 
every week and have kind of a word goal. I think Susan said when she's working on something, she's, she's writing. And so it's kind of like that. If I have something specific, then I have, a, a, I try to try to generate, you know, two, 3000 words a week or something like that. I mean, I do keep a journal. I didn't mean to say I wasn't writing, but I, I mean, I do write all the time, but it's just, I'm much more focused if I know I got a specific goal in mind. Maris, did you speak to that? Oh, uh, I'll just write myself out and say I don't have a good routine. I It took me so long to adjust uh, post-college. Just I'm not a night writer, but evenings when you're working is kind of when you're available uh, to do that. And so it was it was a struggle. I, I'm, I would admit that I'm a mood writer. It, it has to kind of strike me, and I'm trying to, to add more structure to that. That way I can get more done and, and have some some – I guess reliability to to my output, but uh, that have not reached that point yet. <laughs> well, you got a lot going on in your life too, so that's yes. that's, that's very. Yes, and co congratulations on what's coming in September. Thank you. Yes. You'll have some late nights to ponder some uh, new plot points. Yeah, maybe, oh, maybe yeah. Some productivity. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we had a question um, about how folks can can learn more about you and your books and be in touch with you and perhaps even invite you to do these kinds of virtual events or in-personal events where they are as well. And I think we're going to be adding some uh, author websites into the chat. There they are now. Yes, thank you, Anderson. Uh, but is that something y'all want to speak to? Uh, Maris, I expect you may be a little less available than, than right now than our other two, but uh, yeah, our, our Susan and Andrew, is this something y'all are open to? Are y'all out on the road, uh, virtual or in person these days? Yeah, folks can just reach out to me on my website. I am available. I also host a, a poetry series uh, every month called Carolina Poets on Facebook. So we curate nice. uh, poets from around the Carolinas and some of our neighboring states. So if there are any Folks in the uh, any of the attendees that, that have connections in that world, have them reach out to us. We'd love to uh, to bring new poets to the world. That's been a great series, Andrew. I, I've loved the, the live streams that I've gotten to see. Uh, thank you so much for putting that on you and everybody behind the scenes and on camera for that. It's really been a gift. What about you, Susan? Still out and about? Paperback was recently. I am. Was, I'm so delighted to be vaccinated. And to be able to get out the paperback edition of, of Bells for Eli came out this spring, whereas the hardback came out during COVID. And I am delighted to feel freer to, to get out and do live events. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm going off this week um, to several things up in North Carolina, in fact. So I'm, I'm very open to it. And, and you can get in touch with me through my website or message me on Facebook. That's what a number of folks have done. So um, yes, I'm, I'm so happy that we are beginning to move more, t more toward a more normal world. Uh, Maris, I know you've done some virtual launches uh, and virtual programs, but do you have anything coming up that people can, can sign up for? Yeah, I know that um, we'll, we'll have some more details Soon, but um, I'll be doing an event at uh, M. Judson uh, Bookstore up in, in Greenville on August 12th. Great store. Um, yeah, a wonderful store up here. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't have a website, but people can find me on, on Instagram or Facebook. And, um, you know, things will be slowing down when we get to late August uh, in September as we're kind of on baby watch. But um, I'm, I'm delighted to talk to folks and just at least you know, hear what they're interested in. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Hey everyone, um, Jonathan, would you like to just uh, wrap up uh, with a comment or two here? We'd love to hear uh, from you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank everybody in the Zoom room with us, including our hosts and our panelists. This has just been a, a, an incredible hour of conversation and discussion, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to get to introduce these writers, some of whom may be new to you uh, watching out there. And now you've got uh, more books to add to your reading pile, which is always a good thing to have. And many thanks again to North Carolina Humanities and to South Carolina State Library for hosting this, uh, this whole series. And I'd love to say thank you to Jonathan for his 
always incredible moderation and to both Anderson and Melissa. Thank you so much. Yes, thank for hosting you. Us. All right. Well, thank you all. And thank you, um, everyone who's joined us. We're going to wrap up with a couple of closing announcements. Um, if you enjoyed this event, uh, it is part of a series that we had mentioned. We have one more event in this series that is taking place in August. And that link is in the chat if you would like to register for that. Um, they are free to register for. And I will turn it over back to Anderson for our last comment. Yes, thank you all again. We really appreciate both the um, authors for being here, the attendees for being here, and of course for Jonathan for moderating. Always do an excellent job. Uh, we encourage you to follow up with each of our authors. Their links again are in the chat to learn more about their upcoming work and to support them. And on behalf of Reed SC and North Carolina Humanities Center for the Book, uh, thank you all again for attending. And uh, we look forward to sharing with you again soon. In the meantime, we hope you will stay safe and be well and have a wonderful day.